So as Ian mentioned, um, we're just going to cover some of the design requirements of, of integrating these newer, more intelligent battery packs and some of the safety and best practices, things you should be aware of. Um, as Ian mentioned, we're kind of approaching the point where the limits of current lithium ion chemistry are, you know, we're, we're kind of hitting the limit. So there's, there's really less we can push on the chemistry. So we have to be a little smarter on the BMS side. Um, the chart on the right describes the relative energy densities of the different chemistries. And you can kind of see lithium ion and lithium polymer called P lion there. Are, are pretty much near the top of what is currently considered the safe chemistries. Um, and that's exactly why we see them in most, most battery powered products today. And there's some new stuff coming around like uh, solid state batteries or batteries with um, more silicon in the anodes, but there are still, still quite a few challenges to solve uh, specifically with silicon and the expansion. Absolutely. Perfect. Um, so it may be a really good battery, but regardless of how good it is, um, no battery can last forever. So one thing we can do is use the BMS in a way that makes use of all the available energy in kind of an intelligent way. Uh, there are kind of three main goals of doing this. Um, we want to extract as much energy per cycle as we can. Uh, we want to utilize that energy in a way that gives us the best cycle life. And we also need to do this while keeping the cells within their safe operating range. Uh, we're kind of going for a few outcomes as well, um, a reduction in safety incidents. And really, the, the driver of all of it is an overall reduction in total cost over the life of the battery. So that all sounds great, but how can we do it? Um, one of the, the newer concepts that shows some promise is the digital twin. Um, in essence, it's a model of the battery that is precise enough to accurately represent what the battery, the real battery will do kind of out in the world. And it's coupled to that real world battery by way of the sensor data um, from the BMS. So that digital twin tracks the real battery um, in real time over the course of its life. This digital twin concept is one that kind of stems from the aerospace world where there's a fair bit of research that has been done around predicting useful life of aircraft using this method. And it seems like it works pretty well for complex systems like that. Um, we, we think it'll kind of be applied to lithium ion batteries as well, which from the outside, they seem like fairly simple systems, but they're a lot more complex in reality. Um, the environment that the battery operates in really isn't particularly well controlled. And there are several components within the battery itself that can be affected quite drastically by the conditions of the environment. Um, and all that makes their lives very difficult to predict. So in, in its kind of ideal state, the framework would look similar to the diagram on the right. Uh, the real battery and their digital twin are connected in real time by some sort of cloud management system. And then there are a few layers to the structure at the BMS, which performs the real time measurement, um, covering the state of the battery cells, the operating conditions and so on. And then the data processing layer, which updates that cell model, um, does things like estimate remaining life, visualization, that type of thing. Can we go back one, please? Thanks. Um, the connection to that cloud management system allows for a lot more complex modeling to be formed or performed outside of the BMS. Um, you know, because you're not relying on such a small, low power microcontroller, you can do some much more interesting things. So things like um, thermal modeling or you could use some sort of machine learning algorithm to predict the useful life of the battery system. And then having access to that data would let you make kind of more informed decisions about maintenance and replacement of an entire fleet of batteries by replacing them kind of when they're in need of it and less just on a set schedule. 
Get the next slide, please. Thanks. Um, much of this really is only viable at a larger scale. So applications like grid scale storage, multi-site telecom backup, a data center storage, that type of thing, where you've got an entire fleet all over the place. And realistically, you know, a cloud connected battery itself doesn't make a whole lot of practical sense at the small scale. So having said that, we can scale it down a bit and utilize some of the main elements of the model within uh, much smaller batteries. So we can utilize a real-time model of the battery chemistry, um, along with that sensor data to predict things like the state of health of the battery, which is kind of more useful than more or than people currently give it credit for. Um, you can use that state of health data over time to predict the remaining useful life of the battery, um, specifically by monitoring how that state of health number changes over time and then warning users some number of cycles before we really reach the end of its usable life. Um, and all of that can still be done with a cell model that updates every charge and discharge cycle and follows the environmental conditions that the battery has been exposed to over its life. So knowing that we can utilize that subset of stuff at the smaller scale, um, there are a few things to consider during the design of your product. Um, specifically, you'll need a communication interface of some sort to interface with the battery. Um, commonly, they're I squared C or SM bus, uh, RS485 or CAN. For batteries up to about 24 volts or seven series lithium ion, um, I squared C and SM bus are the most common. Um, and RS485 and CAN, a little more popular, kind of in the 48 volt range and above. Um, in between is a bit of a mix, but really either is possible. So. If you plan on designing around a battery, 24 volts or less, um, allowing for an SM bus interface to your host processor will give you the greatest flexibility to interface with, with these batteries. Uh, you also need some sort of user interface, um, usually integrated into your product itself, um, some mechanism to communicate the state of the battery to the user. <laughs> um, there's not really one best way to do this, but it's really specific to how it, your product happens to get used. Um, it can often be, you know, the screen of the device, an accessory device like a phone connected by Bluetooth, a separate display, or in its simplest form, just a ladder of LEDs that can blink different patterns to communicate those states. Um, the device firmware side will also need a little attention. Um, it needs to monitor the battery data in real time, um, alert the user when things are abnormal. And if you want to do some sort of battery authentication to prevent counterfeit batteries from being used, um, that would be the place to do that as well. So we need to do all of that while also keeping things safe. Um, at the most basic level, every lithium ion battery needs some form of protective circuitry within it. And um, this will be built into the battery, uh, permanently connected to the cells for the life of, of that assembly. Uh, the parallel cell groups have to be monitored, monitored independently. Um, just looking at the total battery voltage really isn't good enough. Um, deviations between cells within the module can be uh, small enough that they end up masked and undetectable if you're just looking at the total output. Uh, the protection circuitry has to prevent a minimum set of scenarios, which we'll cover in the next slide. And there are often a few additional requirements placed on battery by regulations, such as you would have in a medical application or a HASLOC type thing. At minimum, uh, the protective circuitry within the VMS has to prevent um, excessive charge and discharge currents, uh, overcharging of the cells, like where they're charged above their maximum rated voltage. Uh, discharging cells below their minimum rated voltage, short circuit, and charging outside of the rated temperature ranges. Um, this is almost always entirely integrated into the battery, although sometimes the temperature protection um, is handled externally by a thermistor that is made available to the charge circuit or in the microcontroller within the application device. Um, and one other thing to keep in mind is that you should have some sort of under voltage lockout on that battery input um, that is set slightly higher than the trip point of the battery management system. Um, the thresholds within the BMS are usually set 
just to keep things safe, but not necessarily to keep the battery operating within the range it needs to be for the greatest length of life. All right, um, there are a few standards concerning lithium ion batteries. Um, for transport, there's UN 38.3 and uh, the IATA 49 CFR part 172.101. Um, every battery needs to be compliant with those to be shipped. And then after that, um, the standards we kind of talked about a couple of slides ago would be um, IAC or UL62133, which is most commonly applied to uh, portable or medical batteries. Um, UL2054 kind of covers the same, but in the North American market, um, IEC 60601 includes some EMC requirements, which apply to the battery and also requires 62133. And then if you have an ATEX or intrinsically safe application, that's usually covered under um, IEC or UL 60079. Um, one thing to be aware of there is that anyone shipping batteries needs to be trained in the transport of dangerous goods. Um, your shipping teams can just do this online. And if you'd like to learn more about this, um, we have this QR code, which you can scan, which will take you to um, a playlist of videos from our previous safety webinar. So to tie it all together, um, this checklist will kind of give you a solid starting point for what you need to be aware of right at the start of the design phase of your product. Um, they are really things as simple as your voltage range defined. Um, lithium ion cells typically run from three to 4.2 volts per cell from fully discharged to fully charged. Um, you need to know your current requirements, both charge and discharge. Um, those will end up ultimately driving which, which cell ends up selected for your battery assembly. Um, operating temperatures, they need to be within the range of the battery chemistry. Um, lithium ion typically has a charge temperature range of zero to 45 and a discharge temperature range of minus 10 to 60. Um, you can push the discharge temperature lower with some specific chemistries, um, but it's just something that needs to be considered right at the start. Um, you need to know your runtime. That is usually the best way to figure out how much battery capacity you need. Um, just figure out how long it needs to run, which current is, and that ultimately becomes battery capacity. Um, the important thing to be aware of there is to calculate that um, at end of life of battery, not start of life of battery. Um, You'll need to be able to handle the battery switching off if there is a fault, just because that protective circuitry exists. Um, and there is some continuous current draw within the battery itself that needs to be considered as well. Um, that does kind of affect shelf life and that just needs to be adequately covered within your process. Uh, you need a communication interface. As we said before, I squared C or SM bus if it's less than seven cells in series. Um, and I squared C RS four eight five or can if higher. Um, on the software side, there there is a standard for communication by SMBus, which is the SBS standard. Um, but there are no standards for RS four eight five or can, so they can really just be developed to fit your application as needed. Uh, you need some sort of user interface, which we kind of covered already. You need to figure out how you're going to charge the battery. Um, do you want the charger integrated into the device? Is it a wall wart? Is it in the battery itself? Um, all of those are viable options. Uh, you need your UVLO, ideally set around that three volt per cell um, minimum discharge voltage for lithium ion. Um, but the precise value does vary a little bit with cells. So yeah, just make sure that that matches the cell spec. And you need to figure out temperature management. Is it going to be done in the BMS in the battery? Again, both viable. Just need to know it at the start. Um, battery authentication. If it's going to be integrated, you need to make sure you have a way to both create and securely store those keys. Um, if that key gets out, then the authentication is kind of useless. Uh, you need to define your battery connector. Um, you will need at least four pins for an intelligent battery and five if you're using a thermistor for temperature management. Uh, regulatory requirements, which drive a lot of the protective requirements. So if it's anything with uh, specific requirements like medical, ATEX, HASLOC, that type of thing, 
there's additional stuff that really needs to be considered ready to start. And of course, your space constraints. Um, it's we would prefer if the space constraints were figured out after everything there is determined, but it's often not possible. Usually the, the battery pocket exists before you figure out what's going to go into it. Um, but that is pretty much it. So with that, I'll hand it back to Karen to talk a bit about the Criterion IQ and she'll take us through the Q&A.